Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have a great one for you this evening. Ron James, I watched his video that just came out and it's called Accidental Truth and it is really good. And you can find that in several places we're going to have it. We actually have it right in the link right now, uh, down in the text that is of the YouTube video if you're watching that live and you can go right to it uh, from there. And so Ron will be on in just a second. I want to tell you a couple of things. Our uh, blog this week from Charles Lear is the Snoopy 2 helicopter UFO encounter. <clears throat> it was a uh, another helicopter case. You always think of the Lieutenant Coin incident back in October of 1973, which was really very amazing in uh, Cleveland, I think it was. Um, and this one is one I had not heard of. It happened back in 1977, and it was a police hel helicopter, according uh, to an article back in 1978. And this is uh, a great work, again, by Charles Lear, so check that out um, on our website, which is podcastufo.com. And you can support the show over there, and we always have uh, fresh blogs every week. And our show notes always contain things that are relevant to every show. So you can go over there and, and check us out. And please uh, support the show if uh, if you would like. And we have our Patreon link right there for as little as $2 a month. You can help us out. And we can stay commercial free on our uh, audio podcast. I know there are commercials during the, the, the videos on YouTube. You can skip right through those. But I, I do thank uh, everyone that listens to the show. And I'm going to bring our guest in in just a minute. But I want to play... There's a couple of clips, and I really uh, like uh, Michael Schratt. He's been on the show a couple of times, and he's invited back. Hope he, oh, I hope he does come back soon. Here's a, a clip from the movie uh, that we are going to be talking about tonight, and this is uh, Michael Schratt talking. Since the early 1900s, there have been reports of crashed UFOs. For over a century, hundreds of witnesses have shared their accounts. There were 119 alleged crash retrieval cases. 1941, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where there were three bodies recovered. The craft was recovered as well. You've got July 2nd, 1947. You've got the Roswell crash retrieval. There was a small egg-shaped craft the size of a Volkswagen with a dome on top. There were five bodies recovered. One was still alive. Move forward to 1953. You've got the Kingman. There were four beings associated with that particular retrieval operation. They were all live. They did establish contact. That craft was allegedly brought to the remote test site in Nevada. We've got the 48 Aztec crash retrieval. This was a 99.9 .9 foot diameter dish shaped craft. There were two bodies recovered on the upper dome of the craft. In the central part of the rim of the craft, on the interior, there were another 14 bodies for a grand total of 16 bodies. That craft was allegedly brought back to Los Alamos, reassembled, and then the retrieval operation or the reverse engineering operation began at that point. That's another clip. We'll be playing another one. And for right now, I'd like to introduce, introduce our guest, Ron James. Welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for having me on. I think this might be my second or third time on your show. I think so, yes. And I have to say that uh, I get sent a lot of videos and I really enjoyed this one a lot. And there are some... Uh, you know, there are some basics for the, the people that are just getting into this, which is a lot of people. And there are so there's a, a lot of new things that I hadn't heard before. And my producer and I both watched it together and really, really enjoyed it. So uh, I'll say kudos to you for a nice job. And I know what work goes into this only because I have a good friend that makes uh, films. And it's a lot of work. You have to dedicate your every hour to it for a long time. Well, there was a lot of years that went into it. I've got interviews that I shot going all the way back to like 2007. And then the actual editing of this thing took a year and a half of just working on that. Uh, and so, yeah, I did all the interviews myself. I did all the editing myself. I wrote it. Uh, Chris O'Brien helped me do the research. But I wanted to create a film that brought people up to speed for the topic today and delivered stuff that had a reasonable case for proof. There's nothing really in the film where we're just making wild speculations. We've, we're building a case and the audience is the jury. And by the end of it, we want everybody to make up their own minds, but I think we make a compelling case for crash retrievals, 
technology studies, back engineering, and even bodies uh, that's never been made before. Right. And uh, you have uh, quite a cast in there. There's quite a few people in there. Um, and a couple of people that I had never seen before, interesting enough. And I uh, there was a young uh, girl in there that is uh, calls herself an activist. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what type of activist she is, but I like to see when young people are coming in to this and, and show an interest. It's, it's great. Yeah, that her name is Elizabeth April, and she's she's a very bright young lady. She uh, she she is a self proclaimed experiencer, and some people think that her stuff is a little bit far out as far as what she puts on the uh, on the internet and the work that she does. But I thought it was important to represent the next generation of experiencers and also people that were, um, you know, people that have a broad following of of people that are just getting into the field and she was a welcome addition to the film and, and she's been a friend of mine for years. So it was great to have her in. Great. So uh, for the person who has not uh, paid attention to the past uh, videos that you've been on, I think, I think it has been two others that you've been on this show. Uh, who is Ron James and how did you get involved in this whole UFO topic to begin with? Well, you know, it's interesting. There was a couple of people in some of the chats on, on this film that are like, well, you know, there's other guys making UFO movies. Uh, and I, and I think that's kind of funny. Um, back in 2007, I was hired by Steve Bassett to produce one of his X conferences. When I say produce, it's because I own a video production company. Um, and so that's like my day job is to do work. I've done bands like Guns N' Roses and Smashing Pumpkins. Music stuff is fun, but I got hired to do this UFO conference and it was like, I'm watching these guys talk and I'm realizing I'd been into the topic, but not, not like this. I'm watching these guys talk and I'm realizing this is the biggest deception ever perpetrated on humanity. And that was back in 2007, I think. And so I decided to pay some attention to trying to do something about it. And over the years, um, between the conference videos that I've shot, which has been a lot, I've done the, the X conferences, I've done the MUFON conferences, I've done Paula Harris's conferences uh, at least once, I've done Contact in the Desert, where, at, where you know I'm producing all the video. I did the citizen hearing on disclosure. I may be one. Of, I may be the guy that's produced more hours of finished content than really anybody out there. Uh, and I'm not bragging, and I'm not even sure that that's true. But I've done a lot, hundreds of hours. And in 2011, I did the Disclosure Dialogues, which won the EBE Awards. It's a five-disc set about disclosure, the current state, right after Obama got elected. Um, and then I uh, co-founded MUFON Television. So there I've built the largest collection of, of commercial-free content anywhere, really. There's over 800 videos, and uh, it's wow. all vetted. Um, and it's a it's a subscription channel that comes when you join MUFON or you can subscribe to it separately. And then finally, I got around to making my latest film, which is Accidental Truth. So I've been kicking around for a long time and it's really been a labor of love. Mm -hmm. um, I like uh, one of my favorite uh, people in your video is uh, Gary Nolan. Um, <laughs> on, I think he's been on one time only trying to get him back. But uh, he said some profound things lately. Was in, I put it uh, in the last uh, video that I had, it's in the show notes and everything there. But, you know, basically when he was asked if there is a presence on an ET presence on this earth, he said 100%. Yes. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know, for someone to make a claim like that, it was like, whoa, you know, um, but in your film, you know, he's, uh, everyone is a little cautious. We don't know exactly where from, which I think is a very good uh, point to take you know, whether it's interdimensional or time travel or another planet in a planetary, um, you know, those are all the, the choices. And maybe there's also a choice that we can't even think of as well that we're getting visited by. Who knows? You know. Yeah, we make that point in the film is that, you know, we call it there, there's a thing toward the end and we call it the A word is like, OK, why aren't these guys coming out and saying, OK, it's aliens. And, and we go over all the different yeah. things that it might be. Right. And, you know, Gary Nolan is making the rounds right now, um, pretty much saying, yes, they're here. It's it's it, it's some kind of technology. It's not ours. It's definitely uh, extraterrestrial or something that we don't know about. And this thing is about to blow wide open the whole field between the whistleblowers showing up in in Capitol Hill and talking to Congress behind closed doors. And the fact that um, 
these people are out there right now starting to be way more candid than they were before. It's about to explode. And for people that, that want to get brought up to speed quickly, uh, that's what the film that I did, Accidental Truth, is for. If you're a person who's never studied the topic but you want to know, like people ask me all the time, what's one book I could read or one movie I can watch? Yes, I get I that too. To make that movie. Yeah. I tried to make the movie that, that you could watch if you don't know much about the topic. It lays out the case. And and one thing I didn't do was go off in, in um, you know, really speculative stuff. I think what we can prove or make a good case for is compelling enough. So it's a, it's a very up the middle, factual, as if I was an attorney and my audience, you guys are the jury, and I'm trying to make this case. And and that's what the film is. And so I think it's perfectly timed because this thing is about to get huge. Yes, I, I've been getting some, uh, well, I, I can't really talk much about the details um, because I really don't know them, but I do hear that there is something pretty much ready to break loose, that it's kind of exciting. Now, we've heard these things before over the years, time and time again, but um, from what I am gathering, this could be a little bit different and much more substantial than prior. Well, so, I can tell you a little bit um, because, you know, I'm, I'm also the media relations director for MUFON. And what that means is that when uh, somebody like Ancient Aliens wants to approach MUFON for content or work with us in some way, I'm the guy that does that. So I work on The Proof is Out There a lot. I work on uh, The Unexplained with William Shatner sometimes. And I work on um, uh, I just did a lot of work on ancient aliens and finally got to be on the show. But another thing is, is that uh, MUFON has been behind the scenes in Washington, D.C., lobbying Congress and working yeah. with, with sitting members of Congress. Mm. And we were instrumental in some of the language in the legislation that's, that was passed that holds the government accountable, uh, the military to be accountable to Congress, and also this whistleblower thing that's, that they put in there. And that's taken a little while to put together. What, the, what this means is that at this point in time, there is a mechanism for people that want to talk about, like, you know, they worked in reverse engineering or they know things, to be able to go behind closed doors still. It's not like they're allowed to call a press conference at the National Press Club and tell the world what they know. But they've got protection to go to Congress and say, hey, behind closed doors and say, hey, this is what's going on. And it's huge because it's happening. There's going to be like in the next couple of weeks, some people going there and having some serious conversations. And, and so our people on these intelligence committees are going to be confronted with some real data that, that they're, um, you know, rather or not, they're going to be able to go public with it. That's a different story. We work with uh, Andre Carson and all these guys. Oh, that's funny. Dr. Richard. Yes, I am arguing the case for uh, the UFO um, reality, <laughs> it's true in the film. But um, yeah, so so this is about to break. I don't know if we're gonna hear the whistleblower's testimony publicly, but we're going to know that it's happening. And I know that there's a lot of people on these intelligence committees that are on our side. They wanna get as much information as possible to us. The, the sitting Congress and, and even really a lot of the guys in the military they're not our quote unquote enemy. They're not the ones that have been keeping this secret. They've been kept in the dark just as much as the rest of us. And you they know, know. Uh, there is a point somewhere in your movie, I, I do believe, where someone talks about a project going, um, you know, from uh, involved, any anything involved in the government and then goes into private hands where there's no oversight. Um, do you think there is a lot of that? has been a lot of that and do you think that will continue to be like a veil that will never be able to really pierce all the way through and figure out exactly what's happening i think that's 100 percent correct i think almost all of this information has been stove piped and compartmentalized and fed to private industry and it's all out of the scope of the uh, freedom of information act and and that's all by design and the thing that's even worse the, the, the sad thing about all of this is that a lot of this information may not have much institutional memory, as in through the body politic, the military, and the government, and some of it might be lost forever. And that's really a, um, that's really a shame, if, if that's the case. But we ran into some things during, during the film where we realized that there's elements of, of the people that have managed this secrecy 
that have no problem destroying evidence. And that's really scary because the idea that things that mean so much to humanity could be lost forever through either people dying and not passing on the secrets or just destruction of, of evidence, um, that's really shocking and sad. And we may never get the truth. Yeah, um, that, you know, there there is, I've always thought about like whoever's a guardian of something you know, in like, is this a generational thing passed down and wherever it's located, you know, is, is it, is it passed on and forward? Or like you said, is it going to go away because it's not, you know, public knowledge? Is that, is that something coming on my end here? A beeping noise? Do you hear that? Um, I hear it, but it's, yeah, it's not me. Oh, I did mute okay. it because I had to cough, but. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, but anyway, so what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that things will never get see the the light of day? For instance, let's just talk about um, big. Uh, I'm trying to think of where that uh, big sir, that video that was taken, you know, years ago of the, mm -hmm. the object sh shooting the uh, the warhead that was a dummy warhead, but it, zapping at it, and it was all caught on film, and then the film went away, or Gordon Cooper's film. It kind of goes away. Do you think these yeah. things are, are gone forever? Or do you think that somehow they may see the light of day and we may be able to get access to these things that are, I mean, if that's not really good evidence, I'm not sure what is. Yeah, you know, it's it's a shame because I think that the answer very well might be this stuff's gone. Um, when we look at the section in Accidental Truth where we talk about the blue room at Wright-Patterson, there was a rumor about the uh, this room at Wright Patterson. They nicknamed it the Blue Room for a variety of reasons, but that was supposedly in the underground hangar where they had a lot of this evidence. And we reflect on Barry Goldwater attempting to get to it, and he was chased off by Curtis LeMay, who ran the base at the time. Um, and so some people did a whole lot of Freedom of Information Act requests trying to find out because there was a rumor that the contents of the Blue Room were filmed. Well, it was a big runaround. It took years. And finally, a response came from the Department of Defense from the from Wright Patterson that said, well, check with these media guys. They might have a record. So this guy and, and I didn't name him in the film uh, just because I wanted to protect his privacy. But we do have the documents. Uh, so this guy goes and he petitions this media department. And sure enough, they come back. They had the file. It was uh footage shot of the blue room project it was called it had a media assignment number and then it said ah it was destroyed in the late 50s um and if it was really destroyed we proved that it existed we know what it was about and if they really destroyed it and and it's not in some raiders of the lost ark archive somewhere that's a real shame because that that film is gone forever and hmm. we're learning more and more that that might be the case with a lot of this stuff that, you know, there, you hear stuff about the military, you know, some mission went wrong in some foreign country and they erase all the evidence. It never happened. And they, there might have been a certain amount of that happening with the UFO thing, too, which would be just just a shame if some of this information is really gone forever. Um, Michio Kaku's in this as well. And I it's, like a, a number of things that he says. And um, he doesn't think and I, I agree with him that the whole world's going to fall apart. If we find out, you know, that we are being visited by extraterrestrials, say, for one or wherever they're from, um, if it comes out that it's, you know, an evidential truth, uh, we're not all going to fall apart. I really don't think so. And I think it, it seems now for the people that are paying attention, I should say, because a lot of people I talk to have no clue. Oh, oh the Pentagon is looking into UFOs. Really? I never heard. You know, I mean, a lot of people don't pay attention to that. So it will be kind of a shock to a lot of them. But I think for a lot of people, it'll be like, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, this is making sense. Um, more, and this is fascinating. I mean, how can it get more fascinating? In my opinion, I don't think it could than, uh, than for any of, any of this to uh, have real evidence. There, there's two things that you mentioned here. And, you know, the first one is what is humanity's response going to be? And, and I'll get to that. But the, uh, the other one is the, um, the whole way that this thing is laying out. And 
what they're doing ever since the story came out in 2017, which I believe was, you know, kind of an approved upon method for, for getting information out, not disclosure per se, because, that, you know, they don't want to disclose everything, but to start getting the information into the vernacular, the public, that we're not alone. So they had this thing, Lou and Chris and, and all the other guys that came out with, with To The Stars Academy, uh, Hal Putoff, all these guys, th this was part of, we're going to break the story in the New York Times, then we're going to really, we're going to come out with the To The Stars Academy, and these guys are going to be shepherding information to the public through these people. But that thing kind of fell apart and it kind of met some opposition. But the whole purpose of it was to whitewash the entire past since before Roswell, all the way up until the Robert Bigelow stuff started um, so that they don't have to have this accountability for any of the things that went on. So now they can say, oh, wow, look at this. We started looking at this in 2004. There was no government programs before then and, and, and make it up like it just happened. Mm -hmm. And please, people, watch Accidental Truth. It's not expensive to watch it, but it lays out this whole thing. And when you see General Sanford in the 1950s saying almost exactly verbatim the same kind of things that, that Lou is saying, the same kind of things that, that these uh, Moultrie and Bray were saying at the hearings, I mean, we put it side by side, and it's so obvious yes. and so compelling yeah. that we just have to laugh. Yeah, I, that was great how you did that. I love that. <laughs> It's yeah, worth it's the like, price of admission. Uh, all right, yeah. So seventy years or whatever it's been, you know. Hey, we have a question in the chat from somebody. You don't mind if I'm watching this, do you? No, 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 not at um, all. Just uh, tell me which question is. So it's from. Uh, uh, and please Carl do put your questions in caps. Okay, what is it? He's asking why UFOs are all different shapes. Oh yeah. You know, Colonel John Alexander is in this movie, actually admitting that he was running programs that he never admitted. Yeah, I'm going to play that clip in a second if you want. Sure. I have that clip. Yeah. But one of the things that he says is that there's this has a lot to do with consciousness and subjective reality. And the reason that we see so many different shapes is because, A, there's multiple phenomena at play, and B, there could be a serious interaction with individual um, subjective consciousness that is at play here. So in other words, you could see there could be five people standing on the beach. One will see the UFO saucer and four others might see a seagull. It all has to do with our, re our relation to physical reality. And so that's why there's so many different things here is because there's multiple phenomenon at play. And uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, Steve, I John Alexander in this movie actually has substantiated stories. He accidentally yeah. tells me the truth. It's one of the reasons the film's got that name. Oh, oh that's funny. Okay, yeah, here's... Uh, he didn't mean to. But. <laughs> oh, that's even better. Here's John Alexander here in the clip. Colonel John Alexander. In 1985, he became the director of advanced concepts at the U.S. Army Lab. After retiring from the Army, John Alexander worked at Los Alamos National Labs. In 1995, Alexander took a position at a new research group called NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Sciences. NIDS was founded by a Nevada billionaire, Robert Bigelow. Shortly after forming NIDS, Robert Bigelow bought the famous paranormal site known as Skinwalker Ranch. John Alexander was there. There was no single phenomena that was happening at the ranch. The stories are so bizarre. What you end up, though, with is something that is terribly complex, maybe more complex than we can imagine. It wasn't long before strange reports of unusual activity at the ranch attracted the attention of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Robert Bigelow went on to form Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Studies, BAS, as the evolved version of NIDS. He was quickly rewarded with a Defense Intelligence Agency contract to study subjects closely tied to the UAP phenomenon. Well, there's another one. Uh, where he talks about the consciousness. I can't remember what that clip is called. I might be able to pull that up. Yeah, there's a few that are out there on YouTube. Whoever Anonymous Rex is, I don't know if I know you or not, but thank you so much for, for the gracious things that you're saying. It means a lot. Oh, yes, I saw that. Yes. Um, yeah, so this, the part of, you make a Oh, Alabama point. Wyatt. Yes, Matthew Modine. I forgot to mention it. Matthew Modine from Stranger Things, Full Metal Jacket, and uh oh yeah enough, he's doing the right? voice yeah yes he is my narrator and what's really funny is he's got he's in that new movie coming up oppenheimer 
and he plays, get this, Vanover Bush. <laughs> and yeah. when I had breakfast with Matthew, I was like, you know, the guy you're playing in Oppenheimer is rumored to be one of the members of MJ-12. And he's like, what's that? And I laid the whole thing out for him. Him and I hung out. I went to New York and did the, I didn't do, I didn't let him phone it in. I went and we hired a studio in New York and we sat together for two days and did the narration. But yes, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Martin. I, no, I, no, not at all. Last questions, I like to help him out. But yes, Matthew is awesome in this film. Absolutely you, great. Yes, he does a great job. You know, I, I'm on the fence about MJ-12. You know, I know Stanton Friedman was 100% sold mm -hmm. that it was, uh, you know, a, the real deal. But I still, I still feel like it's, hmm, I don't know about that. I'm not really I think sure. what we say in the film is that, that you know, we, we do mention MJ-12. We even mention the people that are supposed to be in it. But we also mention in the film that that's very controversial. But our point is that if, if that's not the actual group, it does stand to reason that if you got a crashed UFO uh, you're going, and you're the president, you're going to appoint a group of people to study it. And, uh, you know, it might not have been MJ-12. It might not have been those exact guys, but it was going to be somebody because that's just that's just logical. So, so we don't, but we don't say MJ 12 was real, but we don't say it's not, but we point out that if, even if it, that actual MJ 12 story isn't true, it would have been somebody like that doing something like that. Just, it would have had to have been. Uh, someone sent me a video today of a, not a video, but it was a audio recording, but it was on YouTube of supposedly uh, Albert Einstein's assistant that claims that she saw was flown to roswell in 1947 with einstein and saw the living creature and she talks about it as mm -hmm. you know it's a matter of fact we, i don't know i'm not saying it's real i i know it's supposedly a 1995 interview the woman's uh, passed by now but uh but anyway um who knows about about all that and it seems to me that could be I've figured out too. pretty quickly that, though yeah it seems like that could be figured out with, uh, I'm sure Albert Einstein's travel log was is available somewhere on, on where he went different places. And I would think, unless that was classified and whatever, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. It was a pretty convincing interview, but I don't know what to think. Yeah, I, I heard it. She had me for a little while, but then she lost me. Um, somebody named Wyatt's asking about, people being willing to embrace UFOs in an almost religious manner while they're blowing off traditional religion. It's not really something I want to get into. Um, I suspect that in a lot of ways, the religious establishments have kind of let a lot of people down and they're looking for something else. It's really sad. But, you know, when we have um, the, the one of the things that's really been called to my attention um, is that there's a lot of people out there that Lou, Lou Elizondo told me, and he also said it in the uh, show Unidentified, one of the biggest things that fought him inside the DIA and inside the Pentagon was this element of people that think there's an angelic, demonic element to this, and that's all it is, and we shouldn't be messing with it. And they were able to summon a lot of opposition to this research. So the whole religious implications versus are they ETs, my feeling is that there's a lot of things at play here, and none of us should be clinging to any particular possibility we should be open to the fact that it could be anything and there's a lot of people out there well there, not a lot but there's some i'm not going to mention names but there's some people out there that are literally cultivating a cult-like essence to the ufos and, and building yeah. followers and it, it's it's kind of hard to watch because it's a little bit scary well you know i was having a conversation with my producer today friend and producer and basically we were discussing that sometimes the and i'm not naming names either i would like to almost <laughs> but sometimes the more extreme the more far out mm, the more true. followers you know it, it if it's as absolutely bizarre beyond belief then they're gonna it seems they seem to, as long as they're well spoken they can make you know good arguments seemingly good arguments i should say uh it seems like they get a huge cult following. You know, and I guess that's true. I guess the more bombastic and outrageous you're willing to be, um, the more you're going to find people that are willing to sign on. I don't know what that says about humanity. Well, life's hard. Yeah. You know, like people it's looking for an escape, you know, and 
Yes. Uh, so Anonymous Rex is actually, uh, he's been on this show all this time. I've seen him uh, listening to my show. Uh, that's Tim, Tim Senor uh, from Washington State. We had the uh, Tic Tac uh, eyewitness uh, was on this show. So oh, okay. all this time, yeah, I've seen him in chat all these uh, shows for, I don't know, a couple of years. I didn't know that was Tim. So, well, you know, there's there's so many other the, the, we have haters in this community, and it's really obnoxious. Yes. When, yeah. when Accidental Truth first came out, seven people went on IMDb and left it one star ratings before you could even see the movie. Yeah. And, and I was told nice. this, some other filmmakers that actually do this habitually to other UFO films. And I've been fighting this IMDb thing where every time I look up, there's like, oh, 28 one star ratings. What's that? You know, oh, <laughs> who gets a film one star? And so the, what it, the effect it has is that when you're on Amazon and you see, you know, the Amazon review ratings, which are all good so far, they've been pretty tight. Um, but then you see the IMDb rating and some people can go in. They don't have to, to verify they saw the film. All they have to have is an Amazon account and they could go in and hit, hit it with stars. And, and then that shows up on Amazon right next to your review ratings. And if it says like five stars on IMDb, people think automatically that it sucks. And, and we've been uh, attacked by people doing that. And it's like, wow, because most people that see the film are pretty favorable to it. And, um, and yeah. to, to think that there's people out there doing that, it's kind of lame. So all you guys out there, do me a favor. If, if you've watched the film, I'm not asking you to do anything fake reviews or anything, but go on, go to imdb.com, leave it a star rating that you think it deserves uh, it, just to help get that out of there. Because uh, there are definitely some other people that, that are trying to drag this film to the gutter. And I'm not sure why that is. You know, I, I, I deal with that quite a bit on um, this channel and it's i don't understand why people put their energy into something that is you know but but i i can't think with their brain i'm not sure what makes them think the way they do and why well, they i gotta have tell to... you there's other people with competing films there's other competing yeah. filmmakers that don't want to see you become you know a, pre a preeminent filmmaker and there's a lot of people out there that will play dirty and for this particular film you know, I'm, I'm, this film doesn't pull any punches. It's, it's, it's got the top guys and it doesn't, and we're not afraid to poke them in the eye right on camera. And we're not afraid to tell to, to call out the government. And there was a lot of opposition to this film. The distributor was threatened. I personally was threatened, um, right up until the night it came out and I saw it live on Amazon. I wasn't even convinced for sure that it was going to come out. Um, I thought that something was going to stop it. And so, um, you know that it, it has been a tough film to make and a very scary process and you don't know who's on your side from the distributor themselves to the other people involved to the government to even people that are in the film not actually willing to help the film so it's a it's been crazy absolutely crazy yeah you just have to you have to move what i've found a long time ago is you just move on and and you know as long as my guest is not being insulted in a bad way then um, I let people kind of make, uh, well, kind of show who they are. I'll put it that way. And other people can uh, choose what to say to those people. <laughs> hey, I'm not, you know, I, I, I've got a thick, thick enough skin. I certainly, I hope everybody loves the film, but I know that's not going to be the case. I know everybody's not going to like it. And if, uh, and if somebody's got something to say to me about it, that, is less than favorable i'm happy to hear it um i think it just helps me to make a better film but when people are just trashing it for no reason somebody left a review that said tom DeLong is fat and overweight and we shouldn't have called him a rock star and left me two stars what kind of nonsense is that you know really it's just like whoa really i mean there's people out there like that no wonder the aliens won't talk to us <laughs> that's true and going back to your film and 2011 i think you said it was a five disc set on disclosure in 2011 yeah, it's the disclosure dialogues how many things have kind of come along similar to that that have proven to be so that we're in the, those that set you know i could have made that film in 2017 it would have been the same film you know it, what people don't understand that don't follow this stuff is that we are in this perpetual rinse and repeat cycle when it comes to disclosure it's like oh it blows up in the press it has its run 
and we get a little bit more information, but not really. And then it dies down again. And, and then everybody's fighting for information for another 10 years. Um, the disclosure dialogues was all of the people that have the big people in the field uh, talking to each other about the whole disclosure topic. And it's amazing. It's like, it, like I said, it could have come out in 2017. It still would have been a relevant film. Um, so, and it's for free on YouTube. It's called, it could happen tomorrow. It's out there somewhere. It's definitely for free on MUFON TV. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Um, you know, but you're right. It's, it's like a recycle. You know, I heard, I've heard, uh, you know, uh, Chris Lambright's a longtime friend of mine. He's been paying attention to this for forever. <laughs> He was, you know, he was there when, um, uh, 1984, when I'm just trying to think of his name, came out and said he kind of worked for the government. Um, who am I thinking of? He wrote, he wrote a book with Stan Freeman on Roswell. I can't think of his name right now. It wasn't Don, was it? Don no, Schmidt? No, not Don Schmidt. No. A anyway, um, the point is Chris has been around forever. And he says, oh, yeah, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, here we go again. <laughs> That's what a lot of people are saying. Here we go again. Thanks, thanks seem, Anonymous, giving me a little bit of encouragement. I yeah, it does, it. Seem, <laughs> it does seem different, though. Doesn't it seem different? Like you said, just, a, I don't know, a half hour ago, it feels like it's going to break open. It does feel that way, but has, has it felt that way before? Um, not really like it is now. I, I do think that there's going to be there, – because, look – we're at a different time. We're at a time where we have technology. We're at a time where we have the web telescope. We're at a time where we have yeah. private commercial space that you can only keep the stuff under wraps for so long. I mean, you can only deny life on Mars until Elon accidentally lands on a pyramid. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's like you just it, there's not going to be an ability to cover it up. These objects that we're seeing, um, they're going to be seen more and more and more. And since now we've identified these certain characteristics, and MUFON is getting reports left and right of, of objects that display these characteristics. And the things that they're doing defy the laws of physics, if we think of the laws of physics like we are. Um, you know, I, that something can't go from space all the way through the air, raise 14 miles in a second, come down, splash into the water, go underneath without cre creating all kinds of problems with you know, structural integrity and everything else. And these objects are doing the same thing now that John Alexander it finally admits that he was studying 30, 40 years ago with some of these same guys, Hal Putoff and, you know, Eric Davis and, or, um, yeah, Eric Davis and all these other people. This stuff was, these objects were being uh, observed doing the same thing 40 years ago. It kind of rules out that it's Russian or Chinese because we barely had airplanes when, uh, when these things were happening. So, yeah, hmm. the, it's different now because it's getting harder and harder to deny the existence. So, but, but it's also impossible to admit what they've done to cover it up. So we're getting this dog and pony show and slow drip of disclosure. And, and that's why they, they can't keep it a secret for too much longer, but they can't admit all the things that, that have gone into keeping it a secret. Yeah. Well, you know, when things are, say, coming into the orbit of the Earth, it seems like there would be satellites that be able to detect this. Also, if it's coming through the atmosphere, does it not have the effects like we do when we're trying to come back into the atmosphere and we have, you know, the high temperature coming because of the friction? I mean, do they defy all of that? I mean, that's that's another thing. I'm, I'm always made me wonder another thing, like if they are interplanetary travelers, and traveling, say, as fast as the speed of light or faster or whatever it is they're doing, um, and there's some space dust out there that they collide with, how does that, you know, I always think of these things, and I just wonder if you ever think of things similar to that. Like, how how could they travel without having a collision with, say, a meteor, you know, or whatever you want to call it, a fragment? Well, you know, clearly in order to hit the ocean at, at Mach whatever or a super high speed, um, you've got to be able to be generating some kind of a field that negates the physical reality, you know, kind of like going out of phase, turning a channel. Uh, there, mm. As we mentioned in the film, our perception of space and time is deeply flawed. And so how these things yes. are doing it is that, you know, they don't defy the laws of physics. They sidestep them. 
and, and through some kind of technology. And that seems to be the, the consensus. And I see somebody asking me about the Area 51 alien interview. Um, one of those was this guy named Oren Pelly who made a, he made this, he, he rose to stardom making a really freaky movie, Paranormal. Um, well, I can't remember what it was called. But anyway, he was working on a on an Area 51 type a UFO movie, and one of those alien interviews is rumored to be what was the beginning of a uh, an internet breadcrumb campaign, and that it was all fake. But I don't know exactly which one you're talking about, but one of them was like that. Paranormal Activity. He made that movie, and then uh, he went on to make more. And one of those, like the black and white thing where the aliens kind of jerking around and supposedly um, being filmed, that's supposed to be oh, yeah. fake. Yeah, yeah. Um. That's true. So I want to play this other clip here. Let's see, Robert Bigelow. Uh, I liked uh, I liked the clip you had of uh, him. A couple of different clips. Do you believe that UFOs have come to Earth? There has been and is an existing presence, uh, an ET presence. His unshakable statement regarding the reality of an extraterrestrial presence drew some media reaction. Its significance did not become clear until the story of Bigelow Aerospace and its role in ATIP began to unfold. Confronted with the challenge of weaving Robert Bigelow's informed beliefs into the story Chris Mellon had revealed, Mellon said this. There aren't many people associated with the, uh, the establishment who are so bold and uh, willing to make statements like that. He has his own space stations in space. I don't know who else has done that. And he, by the way, he's done it for a long time. So uh, give the guy some credit. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah, I like, I like, uh, you have a couple of uh, times that you have Robert Bigelow in, involved in your film. And yeah, he's quite a character. And boy, he has done a lot. Uh, you know, I mean, he says himself, nobody's put more money into this than I have. And I do believe that. Yeah, you know the um, and I'll get Cat M has a question. I'll get to that next. Um, Robert Bigelow. When when I asked Lou Elizondo, you see in this film a lot of when people say, "Well, there's nothing new here." That clip alone is a bombshell, because Lou Elizondo is responding to me asking him about what Robert Bigelow said on 60 Minutes about aliens. And Lou Elizondo sits there and, and after he vouches for Bob, he says, give the guy some credit. He knows what he knows he's, he's talking, talking about. about. Yeah. That was Lou Elizondo acknowledging that Robert, what Robert Bigelow said and acknowledging that it's true. And, you know, I'm sorry that maybe there's people that watch the movie where that went, Voomp. but uh, yeah, <laughs> that was uh, that was corroboration for that coming from somebody who would know. Yeah. And um, and there's a lot of that in the movie. And sometimes you have to watch for it. And sometimes you have to listen for it. And sometimes except, you have to make up your own mind. Except with Gary Nolan. He said, oh, yeah, that's another accidental truth. <laughs> it was he great, says that right? a couple of times. Like, yeah. I'm like, Gary, you know, you told one guy you've, you've been studying materials, but not from the government. Then you told another guy that you've been studying materials, but you can't show them because they're classified. So which is it? And, um, <laughs> yeah, that's when he says, uh, yeah, I can't say anything more. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Somebody asked about Skinwalker Ranch. Yes, we, we touched on Skinwalker Ranch in the movie because John Alexander, who's one of the main guys in, in, in my film, admitting things that, that we all knew were true about him. Um, he was with Robert Bigelow the day they bought Skinwalker Ranch, and he actually went and spent the night there the first night all by himself. Um, and this guy is like I joke around about John is like if there was ever a guy that could tell you, but he'd have to kill you. It's John Alexander. This guy's <laughs> knee deep in all of this stuff going way back. He know he knows a lot more than he's ever going to tell us, but he tells us a lot more than he's ever told us before in accidental truth. And he does, he does it on purpose. I mean, he does it by accident. I've interviewed him three times by the third time. I really, I knew the questions to ask and, oh, and it's, it's pretty yeah. good, but yeah, Robert Bigelow and that, that clip with Lou Elizondo saying, give the guy some credit. He knows what he's talking about. That's huge. I mean, that's yeah. as close to a bombshell as we're going to get, except for some of the other bombshells in the movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know when you talk to Lou, you want to say, Lou, can't you just kind of tell me something off off the record? <laughs> and, you know, like when you're talking to him off air. But, you know, he's going to he's going to not uh, 
put he'll drop you a, he'll drop you a couple of things you know but he's yeah. been pretty pretty good about saying stuff in public but you know the, the other gotcha on lou that's later on in the movie about you know there is a they that was that was huge that was like uh yeah okay the reason the film's called accidental truth is is um I think the definitions in the beginning and accidental truth is what happens when uh, words and evidence lead one to a conclusion that was not originally intended to be revealed. And that's, that's, there's a lot of those in this film It's like, you know, all you have to do is look at what they're saying compared to the evidence that we're presenting from other sources, mostly government documents and draw your own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, a guy like you, I imagine, is already on to something else. What do you do? You, are you working on anything related to this topic at this time besides, you know, what you do with MUFON? Well, MUFON is an ongoing thing. Being their media relations director, I'm constantly doing it, uh, MUFON stuff. And then I'm working on MUFON's t TV shows that I make for the channel. Uh, I see David Martin, How Can You Trust Lou? Once you're somebody who's in this community, this intelligence community, you are working for life. If you were to go to Lou Elizondo right now and say, are you sure you're not in the middle of an op to, to bring this form of disclosure forward? He's not going to tell you you're wrong. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I personally believe that Lou is still working. I believe that he knows what he can say and what he can't say and that he's taking guidance from people that are in charge of whatever this weird rollout is. So I don't know. It's not that you can trust Lou or not. He's a, he's a patriot who's abiding by his sworn duty to um, to obey his orders. So in well, here's way, another here's another since we're on this. Sure. Um, I wouldn't say there's numerous um, I know that there was a uh, Goff um, who said that, and but that was not so. And Harry Reid actually backed uh, Lou up, uh, yeah, right in writing. In writing, yeah. Look, see, one thing people don't understand is that there's a, there's very strange ways that these programs work. Lou was actually in the military for a long time, and, and he did do the things that he says he does in the military. But then after the military, he worked for various civilian contractors who are under contract with the government. And so um, his work in the program, and then, of course, when it became, quote, unquote, a tip, um, that was really just a nickname for what carried on into the DIA as, as kind of an ad hoc sort of program. Um, and when I say ad hoc, it's a bit there's. A lot of times people in military, a bunch of guys that have an interest in a certain topic can get together and do unofficial things that are away from Freedom of Information Act requests, but they still have all the resources and access to all the classified materials, all the clearances, and they can run, they can run little programs and little investigative groups. And, and, and there, it's very common, not only just in UFO stuff, but in all kinds of different subjects, then, and, and they call them like ad hoc groups. So there's a whole maze of things that, that come into play where Lou's concerned. But no, he really did what he said he did, and he's really doing what he says he's doing. And um, efforts to debunk him, he, he's fought back. He's, we, we show it in the film. He went to, uh, he, he hired Danny Sheehan and, and, and basically went into the DIA right. and said, you guys yeah. have to stop this. You, you cannot disavow me. And so I, I'm not interested in debating the credibility of Lou Elizondo. Um, he's a he's a intelligence asset uh, and a, a patriot who's doing his job, whether you like him or not. But but I do believe that he's done the work he says he's done. Well, I've been trying to get Danny Sheehan on this show forever, so I'm going to ask you to help me too. <laughs> yeah, I'll say I'll text. You. I I, uh, I asked the guest last week for that, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean I'd love to have him on at some point he he would make a, <clears throat> a great guest because of his whole angle um and interest on this topic and what he's done it, he's done a lot of good well danny sheehan is i mean the, the guy's a force to be reckoned with um <laughs> yeah i just, we'll just <coughs> excuse me okay steven that's enough that's all right uh anyway uh steven i did debate lou how do you think I got, how do you think I was used, I got to use this interview in the film? You know, I shot this interview with Lou Elizondo in 2018 and it, then he was immediately locked up by his handlers. He wasn't allowed to oh, do yeah, any appearances. Right. He, 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 there's a lot of Lou Elizondo out there, but it's always in a zoom call. There's no studio quality interviews with him that aren't owned by 
uh, A&E or TTSA. This interview I have with Lou, much of which is unpublished, is the one of the only interviews of this nature that exists of him. And believe me, it was I didn't pull any punches with him in any of these conversations. That's great. Yeah. I no, you it's it's a great it's a great really uh I really enjoyed that film. I like the questions that were asked. I like where people went and I thought it was uh very informative. I'm really glad whether I had come across your film accidentally, the accidental truth, or some other way, I would have enjoyed it no matter what. You know, so I, I just really thought it was a good, a very good film about this topic. Um, and again, like you said, for a lot of people coming into it, it it was not that's where a lot of people can go wrong when they're making a film. They're making a film, oh yeah, we already know this. Well, mm -hmm. we don't. You know, there's a lot of new new people. I think I think if you're paying know. attention, there's a lot of things in this film that you don't know. And as, yeah. as, as, because I didn't want to make a, a film that was boring to people that are into the topic, but I had to make a film yeah. that would bring your average, you know, bar stool aficionado up to speed. And I had to kind of balance, like you know, admittedly, the first thirty minutes of the film is like a history lesson, but I tried to keep that fresh as well um, with new information. There's an interview with Edgar Mitchell that nobody's ever seen. So we have a question from. Um, uh, somebody about the nasa hearing nasa's oh, yes. been lying about life on mars since 1976 and then when they announced to all of our i mean we're all very happy that they're going to start looking at the uap phenomenon it's like really nasa thank you so whatever my whatever prediction i have for for what well, that's right it's tomorrow tomorrow that's right um, yeah I'm thinking, you know, I think the next step for NASA is going to be to admit that we've found definitive evidence of life on Mars, even if it's microbial. That's going to be the next thing from them. So we get a big announcement. It's going to be that. Um, that's my prediction, that if there's anything groundbreaking from NASA, it will be evidence of life existing or having existed on Mars. Um, or maybe the Webb telescope picked up another planet and there's lights and factory smoke coming off the surface, <laughs> you know, something like that. But life, yeah. life on Mars, probably if there's going to be anything ground groundbreaking, it's going to be that, um, that they've, they've detected signs of life. On they Mars. didn't really put too much money into this research of UAP. I think it was like a hundred thousand dollars or something. It's kind of a joke. It it's like, yes, you know, th these people, it's like, Hey, I'm a government agency and I've got some really cool letters arranged on my refrigerator door. So I'd like to create a new UFO program. Yeah. And it's just another compartment where things can get lost and buried. They spend kind more money on band-aids. But yeah. uh, but anyway, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, Ron. Always uh, always fun talking to you. So uh, can we give people a link to the film? Yeah, it's right down. If you look below, right in the text of this YouTube video, and it'll be in the oh, show cool. notes as well. Awesome. And that's taking them to the trailer or the website or both. Yep. You guys rock. Hey, everybody out there that's I've been seeing so much nice things in, in the in the chat room and it means a lot. Anybody out there that's seen the film, thank you for supporting it. And if you haven't seen it, uh, you know, I, I really hope you check it out and I really hope you like it. And I care more about what you think about the film than I care about the two dollars or whatever I'll make off you renting it. I made this film to put out in the world and it's my contribution to this field. And I'm honored to have been able to do it. Good job. All right. Thanks a lot, Ron. Take care. Bye. All right. Next week, we will... What happened here? Here we go. Next week, we'll be back with Tony Harris from uh, The Proof is Out There. The History Channel is going to be uh, premiering on the 9th, and we'll be back with him next week. So thank you all. And whoops, I don't know how that came up. Um, trying to get back to, <laughs> to close out the show. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Keep your eyes to the sky. Thank you.